Morning everybody and welcome again to Burniston Methodist Church. It's um, a blessing to, um, to, to have another service and another week gone by and um, it's been lovely to be able to meet together when we've been able to at um, Merkhead Farm and in our notices today just say that um, there will be uh, weather permitting um, a socially distanced gathering at uh, Merkhead Farm today and uh, bring your own food and a drink and um, a chair and um, there is uh, a toilet on site and there's lots of hand sanitizer available so um, come if you can from one o'clock that'd be lovely to see you um, we're also thinking about um, the church display the window display um, on the front of church if we're, we're going to take it down this week and we're putting up a new um, display of um, a, like a big sunshine and a tree with lots of leaves on with prayers on if you if you want to so if you want to contribute to that um, do we want lots of yellow hand prints and um, to make the sunshine at various shades of yellow and gold and that'd be lovely and um, also lots of leaf um, shapes green shades of green autumn colors and if you want to write a prayer on on those you very welcome to um, so that the prayer is facing outward so people can come up to the church and read them and pray them as well so if you want to write a prayer about anything really maybe a prayer of thanks or um, a prayer for people you know for the community, for the world, um, a prayer for change. See what God puts on your heart, really, to um, to put to that display. So that'd be great. And if you um, get them to um, to Mary, that would be lovely over the next few days. Thank you. And today we're also blessed to uh, welcome our new minister, John Hartley, and um, his wife Miranda. So welcome to you both. Um, welcome to Burniston Church and we do pray that you will be blessed as you minister to us and as you minister to us we will be ministering to you as we serve the Lord together we look forward to to meeting properly and today we'll be hearing your first sermon so God bless you John thank you so much and welcome to you and to Miranda too thanks for that now let us um Think about our children going back to school and all those involved in education this week. It's a, a bit of an anxious time for them. So we pray for your blessing, Lord, over them. Pray for your peace to reign and all anxiety will be taken away. So um, we're thinking of you, teachers, TAs and children especially, all ages. So God bless you with his peace. Now let's worship the Lord through Psalm 19, acknowledging God as an awesome creator and as the one who loves us enough to come and live among us and give up his life for us. And Lord, we think about those times in this psalm, um, the times when we've, we've forgotten about how awesome you are and we've just gone our own ways. And you are the truly awesome one and your way is indeed the best so as i read this psalm just um, praise the lord and uh, acknowledge your place before him he loves you and he wants to forgive you and um, be in a special relationship with you so let's look at this psalm together it's psalm 19 and it's from the passion bible God's story in the skies. God's splendour is a tale that is told. His testament is written in the stars. Space itself speaks its story every day through the marvels of the heavens. His truth is on tour in the starry vault of the sky, showing his skill in creation's craftsmanship. Each day, gushes out its message to the next. 
the next night, night with night, whispering its knowledge to all. Without a sound, without a word, without a voice being heard, yet all the world can see its story. Everywhere its gospel is clearly read, so all may know what a heavenly home God has set for the sun, shining in the superdome of the sky. See how he leaves his celestial chamber every morning, radiant as a bridegroom ready for his wedding, like a daybreaking champion, eager to run his course. He rises on one horizon, completing his circuit on the other, warming lives and lands with its heat. God's word is perfect in every way, how it revives our souls. His law leads us to truth, and his ways change the simple into wise. His teachings make us joyful and radiate his light. His precepts are so pure. His commands, how they challenge us to keep close to his heart. The revelation light of his word makes my spirit shine radiantly. Every one of the Lord's commands is right. Following them brings cheer. Nothing he says ever needs to be changed. The rarest treasures of life are found in his truth. That's why I prize God's word like others prize the finest gold. Nothing brings such sweetness as seeking his living words. For they warn us, his servants, and keep us from following the wicked way, giving a lifetime guarantee, great success to every obedient soul. Without this revelation light, how? Would I ever detect the waywardness of my heart? Lord, forgive my hidden flaws whenever you find them. Keep cleansing me, God, and keep me from my secret, selfish sins. May they never rule over me. For only then will I be free from fault and remain innocent of rebellion. So may the words of my mouth, my meditation thoughts, and every movement of my heart be always be pure and pleasing and acceptable, acceptable before your eyes, my only Redeemer, my Protector God. So take those words into your heart today and um, as you as the sun shines, enjoy the Lord and know that he wants to bless you because he loves you. And um, so enjoy the rest of the service. Thank you. Amen. This reading is taken from 1 Samuel to chapter 1 to 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 11. The birth of Samuel. There was a certain man from Ramathim, a Zuphite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. 
whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk, and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favour in your eyes. Then she went on her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the, the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home in Ramah. Alcanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. Hannah dedicates Samuel. When her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. Her, her, she said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him to the Lord before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, her husband Elkanah told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with three year old bull, along with a three year old bull, an ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, Pardon me, my lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you and praying you praying to the Lord. I prayed for his child for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked him. So now I give him to the Lord for the worship for the for his whole life he will be given over to the Lord, and he worshipped in the Lord there. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not, keeping, do not keep talking so proudly, or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a Lord, a God who knows, and by him de deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, 
but those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who are full hired themselves cut, cut out for food, but those who were hungry and hungry no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, but she who has many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he, ex and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honour. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. On them he will set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants, but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that he prevails. Those, the, those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and, and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. There was a certain man from Ramathaim, whose name was Elkanah. He had two wives, one was called Hannah and the other Peniah. Peniah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year this man went to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh. Once in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and give me a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. As she kept on praying, Eli observed her. He thought she was drunk, and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant what you have asked of him. In the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, as young as he was, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. She brought the boy to Eli and said to him, Pardon me, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord, I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him, and so now I give him to the Lord. Then Hannah prayed, My heart rejoices in the Lord, in the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord, there is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Hannah cried out to God and he answered her prayer. And when we find things difficult, we need to cry out to God too and listen and wait for his answer. Hannah's son, Samuel, also grew up to trust in God and to listen to him. You might remember the story of Samuel hearing God's voice and thinking it was Eli calling him. It's hard to hear God's voice, but if we practice our listening skills, maybe it will help us to listen to God. So, we made a small game and you have to listen 
to some noises that we put together and then every time you get one right you win a point. my camera. Did you guess it? It's my bike wheel spinning. Did you guess it? It's our Xbox! That's right, it's my trumpet with a mute. Did you guess it? It's the tap! How did you do? Did you get them all right? Hello and welcome to the Manse. It's wonderful for this first time to be able to speak to you at the virtual service at Burniston Methodist Church. And my prayer is that as we walk together over the coming weeks and months, we shall discover together the great things that God has for us and wants us to do in mission in this part of his kingdom. Uh, it's wonderful that uh, as I begin my ministry here in Burniston that you're part way through a series on prayer because prayer is the very engine room of everything that we should do both as individual Christians and as church. We need to discern what God has in store for us. Uh, and this morning I want us to gather around uh, what has been a fairly long reading in 1 Samuel chapter 1 through into chapter 2 to verse 11. Uh, because here is a complete prayer. Well, it's two prayers, really. It's a prayer that Hannah brings to begin with, and then uh, once her prayer is answered, she comes back again and says this wonderful prayer of thanksgiving. Uh, and so as we gather around God's word this morning together, let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, as we gather around your written word this morning, we pray that through it and through the spoken word, we may be led ever closer to your side, that we may be led closer to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And so we get into 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1 and, uh, and through into verse, uh, chapter 2 verse 11. And as we begin this study, we acknowledge that Hannah is a woman with a problem. A problem that has two results, two prongs as it were, but the same cause, and that is that she is childless. And this is not through choice. 
Uh, in verse 6, she says the Lord had closed her womb. She could not have children. She's one of the many, very many so-called barren women in the pages of the Bible and throughout history. She was, of course, blessed with a husband who loved her, who tried to do what he could to please her, to compensate. Aren't I worth more than many sons? But her need for a child was overwhelming, and it wasn't just a biological need. She was living in a society, and we have to understand that this is a Bible times society, when actually to be a childless woman was a source of sorrow. Being a mother was one of the few things that brought women any status or honour in biblical times. And so that was one side of her problem, that she was childless in society where that was to be frowned upon. But the other side of her problem was Elkanah's other wife, Penaniah, who knew that despite giving Elkaniah children, his affections were really with Hannah. And so she was, according to the text, that she provoked Hannah to irritate her, to humiliate her, to say, I'm better than you as though she needed anybody to humiliate her to make her feel any worse. And so she comes to Silo, to this holy place, with this problem, with this pain and this hurt in her heart. And she comes to pray. And part of this prayer is recorded, part of it's given, uh, but part of it was Hannah praying in her heart, quietly her lips moving but no sound coming out uh, but in both of those she was praying from the very depth of her being and this is the first thing I really want to say about this prayer that it is a prayer from the very depths of her being as I said it was a prayer that arose out of her great need but actually this prayer and all prayer needs to come from the heart from the very depths of our being we need to be serious about our prayers. When I was in college, a long time ago now, I was told that the definition of a lecture was a process where information passes from the notes of the lecturer into the notes of the student without passing through the brains of either of them. Now there is some truth in that. It can be a very mechanical process. But sadly, sometimes the same can be said about prayer. I have a number of very wonderful, beautiful books of prayer, but I very, very rarely use written prayers. Because despite their beauty and the craft with which they have written, the temptation can be that we simply slip into a reading mode, that the prayer goes from the page to the lips without passing through the brain, without passing through the heart, without affecting our spirit, without affecting our souls. But that can also happen with so-called exemplary prayers, prayers which are not scripted, uh, but which are often repeated. I remember many years ago writing a script based on the Lord's Prayer to illustrate this fact, to get people to, to really say we need to think about the prayer, not just them being words that we speak. And it went something like, Our Father who art in heaven, oh, I wonder if I've left the oven on, and various other things as the other clauses went their way. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me. Prayers and written theology are, are, are not bad things. And like the Psalms, they can provide a rich resource in times of need, a, a rich spiritual blessing. But they need to be more than words read from a page, something that's automatic. I, I remember going to one service when, uh, at a, at a, I won't mention which denomination this service took place in, but, but I felt that the prayers that were being said were actually a competition between the priest at the front of the congregation to see who could finish first. And there was no engagement, there was no real uh, thinking about what was being said because it was simply a gavel of words. Hannah's prayer 
was not like that. Hannah's prayer was a prayer out of her need from the very depth of her being. And her prayer brought her before God, her God, and it brought before God her need. And in that uh, prayer of Hannah's, and this is my second point, that it reflects the Psalms. Often, you know, we think about the Psalms as Israel's hymn book and that the hymns are full of praise and thanksgiving and all that sort of thing. But if we do that, if we're tempted to fall into that trap, we forget that over a third of the Psalms are what are called lament Psalms. Psalms where the psalmist says things are not right, things are in a, a terrible mess and I want to speak to you, go God, about them. Psalm 22, for example, wasn't just written so that Jesus could say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me from the cross? It was the psalmist's own feelings. It, it reflected his need and his feeling of being utterly and completely alone in the face of difficulty. And that's a prayer that we can bring before God. And there are so many others like it. Psalm 55 says, listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. And I've got to turn the page. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me and I am distraught. That's a real prayer from the very depths of the psalmist's heart. Or Psalm 13. How long, Lord, will you forget me? Forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer me, oh Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes, foes will rejoice when I fall. This is a real heartfelt cry. But a lot of the Psalms, like Psalm 13, actually finish with a confident affirmation. And so if we continue to read Psalm 13 from where I left off, it says, But I will trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. In spite of the problems, in spite of the pain, as a result of these heartfelt prayers, there is a knowledge that we become before a great and loving God. A God who in the midst of our pain can be there with us. And so we can say, whether it's like the psalmist then or whether it's like the situation that perhaps we're in at the moment, in the pandemic or perhaps in other forms of pain, that God is with us, that he's carrying us. And so we can say, despite what's going on, all is well with my soul. Now, one of the things that scholars, theologians believe that happened in some of the lament psalms, at least, is that the first part of the psalm was said as a lament by the worshipper, and there will be an answer from God through the priest speaking a word of comfort to them. And within the Psalms, there is some evidence for that. But certainly here in 1 Samuel, there is that. Because Eli, once he realises that uh, Hannah is not drunk and that she's praying before God, sends her on her way with his blessing, the blessing of God. Go in peace, he says, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked for him, from him. And in that blessing, even though there's no guarantees, Hannah was changed. Actually, in the very process of the prayer, Hannah is changed. She goes away no longer downcast. 
She knew that her prayer had been heard. It had hurt, it had been heard, and it was to be answered. But, but please notice that Hannah has been changed before God answers her prayer. Hannah had faith that God had heard her. And in that, she was no longer downcast, even though at that time her situation had not changed, even though at that time she's going to go back to Penaniah's provoking and humiliation and irritation. She's going to go back to a society in which she's still childless. And yet her circumstances, because of this prayer, had been changed. She poured out her heart to God and knew that God had heard her and that God had comforted her. But in Hannah's case, that prayer was also answered, and it was answered in the way that she wanted it to be answered. And obviously it's recorded here in 1 Samuel because it was answered, and Hannah's child was the Samuel of the title. But before moving on, one of the things that I really want to stress that this prayer illustrates is that the prayer changed Hannah before it was answered that she was no longer downcast and even if she'd remained childless that she was transformed now this isn't just me hedging my bets on prayer but it is a truth that in the very real act of genuine engagement in God in a real way she and we can receive comfort a real comfort at that the actions of a, her well-meaning husband could not begin to fulfil. But of course, for Hannah, in addition, there was the blessing of the child she so desperately, desperately wanted. And so to move into chapter two, and I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this, we have... Uh, the second prayer of Hannah, a prayer of thanksgiving, a prayer of, of wonder and, and acclamation, a prayer very much like Mary's prayer when she meets Elizabeth for the, the Magnificat, a prayer uh, where she, they pour out their thanks to a God who changes situations and circumstances, a, a God who exalts the lowly and humbles the proud, a, a God Lord who can bless and who can bring retribution. Hannah rejoices in a God who is sovereign. And that's the God that we serve. That's the God that we come before, the God who can change everything. A God who is in charge, a God before whom we should humbly bow the knee. And for Hannah, this prayer of thanksgiving comes out of the fact that God has answered her prayer. He's worked a miracle within her that she's now got this child and she's so thankful. And so now she's not only been comforted, she's been vindicated. Her disgrace has been taken away and that was something that no one else other than God could do and it was all of God and God's gracious action in her life. And so she comes before God with this outpouring of thankfulness and praise. And actually, that should be really where we start with our prayer. It should be our starting point. And again, that reflects the Psalms, because they often begin acknowledging the greatness of God, of echoing his wonders and his deeds, of the things that he's done in the past, of saying that this is the God who created the heavens and the earth. And then moving on to a prayer which acknowledges the need. But sometimes, of course, this prayer can be just like the prayer in chapter 2. A prayer of genuine thankfulness, a prayer which acknowledges the wonders and greatness of God. A prayer of acclamation. A prayer that has no other purpose than to pour out honour and blessing and gratitude to a God who is worthy of all praise, all honour and all blessing. A God who's worthy to receive everything that we can bring to him and still worthy to receive more. But that praise, just like those words of need, 
need to be more than just words. They need more to be them need to be more than just a sort of hallelujah. They need to be an hallelujah because we've got good things to celebrate. They need to be just as real and heartfelt as Anna's earlier prayer. Prayers which are words that are not just words, but with meaning. And so Hannah's prayer, both in chapter one and in chapter two, are both heartfelt. Heartfelt firstly in their need, but then heartfelt in their thankfulness. And we have a great God. And together over these next months and years, we're going to learn more about that great God and what his purposes and plans for us here are. And it will be a great joy to share in learning that. But underpinning everything that we're going to do together, there is that need for prayers to be heartfelt, to be real and not be simply words that we speak. And so let's join together in prayer now. Let's pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this prayer in, uh, recorded in 1 Samuel. And Father, we pray that uh, you would inspire us, that by your Holy Spirit burning within our hearts, that we would come before you and our prayers would truly be a prayers of offering and sacrifice and of thanksgiving and acknowledging from the very depths of our being that you are our God and we are your people. And so, Father, inspire us and lead us and move us into the places where you want us to be. And may we continue to give you thanks and praise and honour and blessing, because, Lord, we know that you deserve all these things. In Jesus' name. Amen. Morning everybody and welcome to our time of prayer. I'd like to begin by just saying the Lord's Prayer. We can all say this together. Uh, I'd like to say it quite slowly just so that we think about the different phrases of it as we go through it. Uh, and then I'd like to, um, to just pray uh, thinking about our dependence on uh, God our Father. Uh, we're not wired to be independent, although we live in a culture that's very hot on independence and doing things our own way. But it's good to remember that, uh, especially in a pandemic that's still continuing, um, we need to very much bring our needs to God. But first of all, let's say the Lord's Prayer together slowly. So let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Father, we now come before you just asking you to meet all our needs and the needs of those for whom we want to pray. We start off with the needs of the world. We thank you that you are the creator of every good and perfect gift. Thank you for this lovely world that we live in. 
that you've given us richly to enjoy. But forgive us for the way that we often abuse it. Uh, we don't look after the environment as we should and help us to get behind uh, things that uh, enable us to respect the world in which we live and promote it and do things to enhance it. And we do pray for all those organisations that seek to do that and especially those that honour you. We pray for those in the world, um, many uh, far less fortunate than ourselves, not just in third world countries, although we do pray very much for those who don't have enough to eat, uh, where water doesn't just come out of a tap. We pray that you'd make us generous, Lord, to support initiatives to bring fresh drinking water to people who haven't got it and uh, to have a real heart for those who are marginalised, for those who don't have enough food. Uh, make us generous, Lord, in our giving, we pray. So we do pray for the world around us and we pray for those um, places where there is war and hatred and bloodshed. We pray for those parts of the world where Christians are persecuted and where other minority groups are persecuted. We know that you hate anything like that. We pray again that you would help us to to support um, organisations like uh, the Barnabas Fund and Open Doors, people who seek to alleviate persecution and highlight it and raise awareness. We do pray, Lord, that by your spirit you would create in mankind a, a new and clean heart Again, we pray, deliver us from the evil one and uh, look after all who are disadvantaged and marginalised and particularly those who own the name of Jesus, who are persecuted for their faith. And Father, moving a little nearer to our own situation in our own country, in fact all countries who are seeking to deal with the pandemic. Again we pray on a national scale but also on a European scale and on a, a, on a global scale to, to give wisdom and guidance and help to those politicians who are having to make difficult decisions those in local governments seeking to implement them and in smaller organisations seeking to implement them. Our own church as we seek to go back to worship again in our own building, on our own premises. Give us um, wisdom and guidance and do open doors, Lord, we pray, and make a way where up till now it seems as if there is no way, but we pray that it would be possible soon for ourselves and other churches to be able to meet again to worship you. We know we can worship you anywhere, but it's just so lovely to be able to come together in worship um, in our own church. So we pray about that and commit that into your hands. And we pray about our own um, local situation, our village and our community, our friends and our families. Again, we remember um, that we are created to be dependent on you and most of, most of our world uh, live their lives as if that is not the case, as if we're independent. 
We thank you, at least for the fact that this pandemic has highlighted the fact that we are not independent, we do have needs. We turn to you in our time of need and uh, we embrace within that uh, our own families and friends. And Lord, I just pray that as we visualise our personal friends and family members in their many and varied needs, We just silently pray in the quietness of our own hearts for those individuals. Lord, bless them, we pray. Lord, be a real source of strength to them. Deliver them from anything that is, uh, is, a, is a problem in their lives or is uh, really blighting their lives. Lord, we ask that you would be to them all that they need and especially um, friends and family members perhaps who do not know you do not know the strength and the help and the love that you can bring into their lives and we ask you lord jesus to be a real source of help and strength to those known to us personally who need it at this time. People suffering from illness, maybe bereavement, but other needs as well. Lord, you know what those situa situations are and who those people are that we're visualising at this time. You're an all-knowing God, you're omniscient. And you're omnipotent, all powerful, able and capable to deal with every situation. So help us, lift us up, we pray ourselves, set our feet upon a rock, but also those known to us that need your help. We're glad we can do this, Lord. We're glad that you're always only a prayer away. And we do now commit into your hands ourselves, our loved ones, our local community, our country, and indeed the whole world. Grateful for the fact that you care for everyone, every person, and every situation. Thank you for being to us all that we need. And please answer our prayers. We bring each and every one of them in and through the name of our dear Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>